to the Italian Football Podcast. Hello everybody and welcome to the Italian Football Podcast. I'm Carlo Garganese, joined as always by Nima Tavali. On today's show we will review all of the weekend's Serie A action, starting with, of course, Inter's sensational 3-0 thrashing of Napoli at the Stadio Maradona. Inter sending out a, a Scudetto message to the rest of Serie A. Um, but what about the mess at, at Napoli? Will they even finish in the in the top four? Um, Juventus, though, are only two points behind Inter after a dramatic ending against Monza. Milan have stopped the rot as Luka Jovic scores his first Milan goal. Roma move into the top four above Napoli with another late comeback. And we will review all the other games in Serie A. And we will also react to Italy's draw for the finals of Euro 2024, which were made at the weekend. A very, very tough draw for Italy. We have Baggio and Prem Face of the Week. Plus, we are introducing a new segment this week, which, uh, judging by the reaction on social media, I think everybody is going to enjoy. We hope it's as, as, as popular as Prem Face of the Week. Okay, so for all of our first-time listeners, this is our free weekly episode that we do every Monday, reviewing the weekend Serie A action and all the biggest talking points in Italian football. If you want to support the Italian Football Podcast and receive all of our content that we do throughout the week, including a weekly Q&A episode every Tuesday, where we answer all of the questions from our patrons, plus the weekly Thursday midweek review show, plus interviews, post-match reaction, and much, much more, then go to patreon.com slash TIFP and become a subscriber for just $2.99 a month, plus VAT. You can also sign up to be a paid subscriber on Spotify. We will provide the link in the description, the same price and terms. And for all of you that listen on Spotify, Apple, and iTunes podcasts, we'd really appreciate if you give us a five-star rating, give us a follow, give us a like, give us a follow. Um, I said that twice. <laughs> We're on YouTube also. Uh, it really helps us to grow and do more quality content for you guys. So let's get into today's show. Okay, so right, we'll start off with Inter against Napoli at the Stadio Maradona. Inter thrash Napoli 3-0, an emphatic win for the Nerazzurri. Let's discuss this first from the Inter point of view, Nima. Um, this is Inter sending out a signal to the rest of Serie A, isn't it? Yes, uh, for me, I mean, if you look at the game as a whole, I think 3-0 was, if you look at how the game played out, um, I think is a little bit maybe... Um, too big of a win. I don't think Inter were three nil winners. Uh, I've seen them play better and create more chances and dominate more games and not win by three nil. Um, but if you look at the maturity again, I keep coming back to this word. Inter, no, for me, a big team, a great teams, the best teams. They know how to suffer, as as they say in Italy. Uh, and Inter suffered. And they know how to suffer and to go through those periods of suffering in games and come out on top. And that, to me, is the signal, the sign of a big team, of a great team, a, a, men, a winning mentality, a champion's mentality, uh, which I think Juventus showed against Monza as well. Um, and because Inter did suffer. Napoli were good in the first half. Napoli uh, pressured Inter. Now Napoli caused problems. Inter were a little bit... Uh, under uh, you know didn't we were a little bit disoriented and 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 and, and, and struggled uh, defensively uh, after especially when defry was injured but they managed to go through it and 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 they they have this kind of belief about them um and i'm sure we're going to get to it but i have to say for me when when you win 3-0 and the man of the match is jan sommer that tells me pretty much everything i need to know what a signing he has been some of those saves are just un they're miraculous he saves into the in order to win these games in order to to win trophies to win titles you need your goalkeeper to be this good you need him to make these incredible saves uh and 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 to keep the game balanced or when 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 making these saves so that when you go forward you, you you know, you can, if you score your chances, you kind of pull the rug under your opponent's feet. And I think that was the key here. Jan Sommer was world class yesterday. And he has been world class, I think, pretty much consistently since joining Inter. And it's truly, truly remarkable the, what a, you know, how he's becoming 
the foundation on which Inter Scudetto will be, if they win, will be found on, uh, will be founded on. He's he's absolutely outstanding. Um, the way that he controls his penalty area, the fantastic reaction reflex, reflex saves. It's just uh, his aerial, his command of the area, his aerial ability when going out. I mean, it's just what a signing. What an absolutely amazing signing he's been. No, he has been. He's been fantastic. The the save in the first half from the long shot from Elmas was 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 excellent. Um, the save from Kvarat Scalia at one 0 oh, when he tucked it round yeah. the side was fantastic. The the best of all was the one from Osman. It was offside, so it doesn't count. But but yeah. it was that was it doesn't matter. He didn't know that, and that was a that was an incredible save um, as well. Um, yeah, he was he he's great, and it's just incredible when you compare him to 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 the player that Inter sold, uh-huh. Andre Onana. Um, who I think most people were, were were kind of Inter fans and neutrals were like, well, Inter probably didn't get enough money for him, and we're losing a, a pillar of the team um, that, that 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 took Inter to the Champions League final last season. It was so good for Inter last season, mm. uh, and it's a downgrade. Um, well, <laughs> it's not been a downgrade. Um, it's been an upgrade if you're if you're looking at Onana's form for, for United. I mean, just last week again another horror showing. For, for for Man United in against Galatasaray, two two mistakes. That you just think, wow. I mean, what is going on there? And then you compare that to Sommer, um, who isn't making mistakes at all, and he's making big saves as well. Um, so yes, Sommer's been great. He's been fantastic. Uh, the other two standouts for me in this game, first of all, of course, Chalanoglu. Um, I mean, he's unlocked the game. Um, you know, which, like you said, the first half was was tight. And um, he's unlocked the game with it. I mean, that is a world class goal. That's that's a, that's a it is. that's a shot that only a few players in the world could hit a ball like can hit a, hit a ball or could hit a ball like Chanelogu did last last night. I mean, it was like an arrow, um, bang. Uh, he, I mean, we know he's about his, his how good his shooting is um, from long range from out of the, the area. Just last week, I was saying that Kandreva has been um, after he scored that great goal or that great shot. Against uh, Lazio, I was saying that you know in the last 10, 15 years, Candreva for me is probably top five in the world for long range shooting. Well, Chalanoglu's got to be kind of up there as well, hasn't he? I mean, for that, mm, for- no, no, there's no doubt. Yeah, there's no doubt. Um, but he he was he was really good. But I feel like Ish- in the first half, I do yeah. I do feel the midfield was a little bit off, uh, and Chalanoglu was was all of the midfield. They were not on the same wavelength. Parella, Mkhitaryan. And Chalanoglu were a little bit off, um, and and it's it's the reason I think for that, and it's really interesting to see. And this goes back to the maturity thing. This is the second big game in a row in the Serie A, and it's the second big game in, in a row where Simone has evidently made it clear in the first half, especially, and that's another point I want to get to: Inter's first versus second half performances, which the stats are undeniable, but. In the first half against Juve, in the first half against Napoli, he tells the midfield that he doesn't want them making forward runs. He wants to contain. Um, and if he, uh, there was a stat on Sky that showed Inter winning eight games in the second half, either being a goal down or it being goalless at half time, but then putting in the extra gear in the second half. And that's exactly what happened against Napoli yesterday as well. Because what he did in the first half, we saw again Mazzari do what Allegri did completely nullify, put tight on Inter's wing backs, and that renders them useless because they can't dribble, neither are one of them. Meaning that if you don't give them, if, if you cut out their time to cross in balls, neither one of them, will they become pointless. Now, how do you counter that? Well, we saw, because I tweeted that out, Simone needs to counter that. Well, how do you do that? Well, you do exactly what Simone Inzaghi did. He inverted Di Marco, to press higher up. So essentially it was a 3-4-3 in the press. You had Di Marco, Lautaro, and uh, Turam pressing Napoli really high up the pitch. And you had the midfield, Mkhitaryan, going wider um, to cover the space that he left behind. And all of Inter's press became much more cohesive and effective, um, which they, they weren't doing in the first half. But he did that in the second half, and, and Napoli never really recovered because Mazzari didn't know how to react to that. Um, and then, of course, you know, the games are decided by the episodes, Inter score quickly, you know, to score wonderful goals. And then that kind of just ends Napoli right there. But it's it's very interesting from a tactical point of view to see how Inzaghi 
um, like counters these situations, and that's the the prova di maturità that we've seen here. Like he's 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 going through these examinations, these exams mm. of of maturity and and growing with with the job and his team as well. Yeah, um, this team is now really really the three years we've seen it. It's been step by step growth in terms of tactical maturity, mental abil- mental maturity, uh, and and the ability to to react and resolve and know how to suffer without losing their heads, without losing their belief. They just keep drumming on. You know, if they go a goal down like against you, they just put in, they just, they work harder. They, they, they take that as a, they take things in the right way. Yeah. And that's, that's something that we've not seen under Inzaghi until this There's season. such a complete team inter as well. And you, you, you mentioned that point there about, you know, containment in the first half seeming to be a tactic mm. for, for, for into this season. Mm. Um, it is. Now, People, depending on your view of the game, will, will have different views, whether that's the right thing to do, uh, you know, it, but it's working. Um, I mean, mm. but one thing that is undeniable is that in this in this game, for all the, the possession that Napoli had, I mean, Napoli were, were good in the first half in terms of, we're talking about Napoli in terms of possession, in terms of per- territory, in terms of the pressing game was, was really good. Um, and they dominated possession in the first half, Napoli. And into were just kind of more de- being quite defensive, but it, Napoli created nothing in the first half, nothing at all. They had two long shots. One okay hit the crossbar. One was a fantastic save from from Sommer from Elmas, but they created nothing. They, they had nothing else. They had a, I knotted it down at half time. They had 0.23 xg in the first half. Napoli. So for all their dominance in possession and territory, they created nothing, and that that is testament also to. It's just how good Inter's defence is. And this is an Inter defence that had no Bastoni, no Pavard. De Vrij came off injured in the first half and was replaced by Carlos Augusto, who's naturally a full-back slash wing-back, playing at left centre-back. And they still created nothing in that first half. And and over the course of the, the game, yes, Sommer made a brilliant save from, from Claret Scalia. Um, and maybe Napoli were unlucky not to score at least one goal. But again, look at the XG... Uh, at the expected goals at the end of the game, Napoli 0.79, which I think if you're restricting Napoli at this Maradona to 0.79, you're doing pretty well. And Inter XG mm. of, 0, of 2.61. I mean, this is a compl- they completely dismantled them. So the tactics were spot on, and it just shows how good the defense is. And I have to say again, Acerbi was was magnificent. Oh, was absolutely. Magnificent. We have to at this point. He is the best central defender in Italy, like Italian central defender, and it's not even well, yeah, close. The, yeah. <laughs> it's it's just, he's, he's, he's so damn good. He's having one of those insane seasons. He's better this season than he was last season. And last season, he was brilliant. Um, I'm, he's, he's reaching a point now where I'm going, well, he, is he amongst the five best central defenders in all of Europe? I would argue he is on form. Um, he's been absolutely outstanding. I mean, the way he neutralizes these strikers, I mean, it is a team effort. Let's remember, Inter defend collectively and, and the balance of the team helps him out because he's not a very quick player. Um, but it's he, he was outstanding yesterday. Um, I thought he the way that he commands and the fact that when you know he can play on the left, he's actually pretty decent as, as a left center back, but in the middle, he's just unstoppable. Mm. Um and and speaking of injuries, inter, I mean, we have to talk about injury. Inter decimated in defense now. Dumfries out, De Frey out, Bastoni out, Pavard out. It's it, I don't know what is going on in Milan in with central defenders <laughs> in both ends of the city. It's like some sort of virus that seems to go only attack that seems to injure only central defenders in the city of Milan. It's mad, but it's uh, this is something they have to handle and. You know now, well, well, but, but with 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 Carlos Augusto, I mean, he was great. He, he was he was really good. He was really yeah. But he was brought in to play there as well because when they signed him, it wasn't just as a wing back. It's also because he has played as a central defender. He played as a libero, I think, in in, in Brazil for the certain certain games. Mm. Um, so you know, he he is a good. Uh, he, he can play as a, as as a as a central defender, and in the back three, I thought he was very good. Because what he does, he's he is he is technical. He can beat his man. He's he's he he can go past. He can dribble. I mean, we saw the the back heel pass to Lautaro for the second goal is just stunning. And he pushes forward. And the way that Inter play, 
the way that Nzagi likes to use his right and left center back to push forward and overlap, he, he fits this system perfectly. He really does. For me, I'm starting to think, you know, that, that means that you have lots of options. Uh, of course, not indefinite options or not, you know, because at some point you only have a finite number of players. So this injury crisis is serious and we'll have to wait and see what happens to Defray and, and Dumfries. Uh, it looked like it was cramped for Dumfries, whilst Defray it looked like a muscle injury. Um, but we'll still have to wait and see. But it's 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 a it's a mature Inter, and I was looking. I think it's the ninth clean sheet in the Serie A alone. Yeah, ninth out of fourteen. And it's not been like he's not had any shots to save. He has. He's pulled just pulled out monster saves. And it's so it's so yeah, just come back to, I just just wanted to come back to Chelanoglu and I, I think that Brozovic has not missed been missed at all. Um no. at all. Um moving Chelanoglu to Regist is one of Inzaghi's best things Inzaghi's done um mm. at, at, at in so it's something that he's dreamed up himself. Uh and Chelanoglu, like we said, I mean he's the best he is de- well, <laughs> we'll come on to Barella, but he's definitely the best centre midfielder in, in Serie A this season. He's got seven goals in all competitions already this season, playing as a regista. I know some of them are penalties, but still, seven goals in all competitions at the start of December. Um, he's he's world-class now. There's, there's definitely no doubt about that. And Barella, um, I mean, he, he hasn't had, he's had a bit of a difficult season at times this season. We know the inconsistency that he's had since the Euro, since Euro 2020, um, in 2021. But um, but first goal of the season, which I thought was a brilliant goal, the way that he, the way that he took it, the close, the uh, close, dribbling and then scoring. He got the assist for the first, sort of an assist for the first goal from Dumfries. I don't know how, if he touched it that much, but we saw the the, the, the intent uh, and he was, I thought it was a welcome return to form for, for Barella um, as yeah. well. And he was really good in the international break for Italy as well. I was I was going to, I was going to say that because Barella has struggled this season at Inter. He's not been good. Let's be honest. He's been pretty bad. He's been one of Inter's worst players so far this season, but he's been good for Italy and he was really good in the last international break. And again, he started this game poorly, miss hitting crosses, miss hitting passes. He just didn't look in sync, but then he goes and scores that goal which I hope will unlock him for Inter as well. And it is a world-class goal. It's a fabulous goal. Um, Inter scored world-class goals. And and I include the offside goal where Turam was off by just a whisker. The link-up between Barella and Lautaro for that first goal that was offside is is magical. It's one of the most beautiful link pass, like one-twos I've seen. It's so, so nice. Go and look at it again. It's It's a shame it was... I would have traded one of the other goals for for that one because it was beautiful, um, and that that's what Barella can do, and that's why you get one. You know, I get frustrated when I watch him and he can't. He does, you know, when he's when he's not doing the simple things right because we know the talent this guy has. It's it's through the roof. Um, he you know when he's at his best, he's one of the best midfielders in the world, mm. um, and it's the Inter need him to be in form, and I hope this can lock him, but. Yeah, look, I agree with you. I think the, the, the midfield click hit into gear um, in the second half when they pushed higher up. I think that role of him being... Because in the first half, just like against Juve, he wasn't really much of a box-to-box. He was much more laid back and covering and closing off spaces, and he doesn't like doing that. But Barella wants needs to... to for Barella to, to really shine... He needs. To, he can't be rigidly controlled. He needs. To I agree. Be... That's the one thing that I've, that's really irritated me about the way Barella's been used, not just by Inter since the Conte times, yeah. um, but also for Italy by by Mancini. Is how he just shifted over almost as a four four two right midfielder at times mm-hmm. on, in that right mm-hmm. channel, and it irritates me because yeah. he is limited when you do that to him, and he and he, and he can't. Uh, use all of the other qualities that he's got, including what yeah. we saw for the goal, you know, because he doesn't, because he's not able to get into those positions and, and have the freedom to, to do those kind of things and get around the pitch and be the all action player, which that he is and the complete player that he is. So that's irritates me. And I almost wonder whether it's your, I mean, yes, I know it's a tactical role, both for Inter, but also for Italy under Mancini. But I feel like, yeah. well, you know, Actually, Italy, Italy and Inter, to a lesser extent, are getting harmed by caging him up like that because you're losing a lot more than you're gaining doing that. And that's one of the things that has irritated me about the way Barella's been used in the last few years. Uh, I, I, I'm totally with you there. 
Mm. No, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know. It's, he, Simon Inzaghi has to do, you know, he's got, they've got Denzel Dumfries on the right and, and they have to, you know, mitigate his weaknesses and get the best out of him. And so sometimes you have to sacrifice things, right? But it is what it is. But I do agree that that is something that Inter, because in the second half, you saw when he gave him license to push up, when Inter were more aggressive, when he inverted Di Marco and they pressed in a 3 4 3, moved. Mkhitaryan a little bit more to the left, allowed Barella more more space to roam. Well, then you saw what happens. You know, he he does that Alberto Tomba slalom run and scores, and and he was just generally brilliant. Yeah. Um, so no, it's it, it is an interesting thing, but I think it's in these big games, Inzaghi is right to to go in there and 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 to ma- manage this because again, Juve away, Napoli away. Inter come out of these games with four out of four out of six points. Yeah, they've got Inter in a great home. position. Um, I mean, I tweeted it last night. Uh, I know we'll come on to Juventus in a bit and we'll discuss them. But uh, for me, I mean, Inter are, are the clear Scudetto favourites in terms of quality. They've got the best team. They've got the the best and the deepest squad. Um, they, I mean, you'd have to say they have the best coach, seeing as seeing as they got to the Champions League final. Although some would say, okay, he needs to win a Scudetto before you before you can. I'd say that with 100% certainty, but for me, they have the best coach as well. Um, and they're in a great yeah, position. They They've already, like you no, said, no. they've played Juventus. They've got the two toughest away games of the season out of the way, Juventus and Napoli away. You know, when we consider yeah. Milan is, yeah. a, is a, a neutral venue. Yeah, it's yeah. a home game. It's yeah. a derby. Yeah. Uh, and they've played Atalanta away as well, which is one yeah. of the other tough away games. So they're in a great position. They've got a lot of their toughest games out of the way and they're two points clear at the top of the table. So they're in a great, great position. But I would just go one step further because when I tweeted that out, our, our friend of the show, Adrian Del Monte, who's actually going to be, we should announce, going to be guest hosting the podcast um, next Monday because I'm going to be away. So Adrian will be will be doing this next week with, with Nima. Um, he quote tweeted me and said, actually went a step further and said, well, Inter should be, should be, uh, Inter have the quality to go all the way in the Champions League because they got to the final last season and they're a better team this season than they are last season. Hmm. I wouldn't go that far, but yeah, they are. I, I mean, mean, they are a better team Hutchinson. this season, aren't they? Yeah, they, well, they are. They're by far a better team. But also team. from a maturity um, point of view, I think I've said it a few times. I think they've taken so much from getting to the Champions League final. That's given them mentally so much, mm. so much. It really has. The intangible stuff that you can't, you just, you can't measure, you know, that. Well, so far, I mean, one thing that stands out this season compared to last season is the away form. Inter have have played seven games in the Serie A away, six wins, one draw, only conceded twice, one of which came against Juve, and the other one against Atalanta. So th- last season, they were awful in the Serie A away. Um, if I remember correctly, last season, Inter were sixth in, in the Serie A for away games. Um, and that is the, the, the winning away from from home, barely conceding anything, that is a sign of a team that has matured, that is ready to challenge, that that, that is a Scudetto favourite, that is a league favourite. It's a long season. These injuries are going to cause him to problems. Um, you know, we'll see when Bastoni's back, but they do get a few days rest. Mm. They got Udinese at home, Sassiedad at home, and then they got Lazio away. And after that, you know, it's with all due respect, it, it gets easier because you got Bologna in the Coppa Italia at home, Lecce at home, Genoa away, uh, Verona at home, Monza. Yeah, they'll, they'll have the top got... Let's move on anyway. Let's move on. Let's talk. Let's... I just got to say though, I just got to say though, on the penalty. Yeah, yeah, I want to come on to that. I'll, I'll post that to yeah. you. So we're going to move on to Napoli first. We First of all, before we discuss what's all going wrong at Napoli, we have to, I know this has caused a lot of anger with Napoli. They refuse to send out Mazzari to speak, blah, blah, blah. Um, I think that was a good decision. Let's start off. Matsari with- would have come out there and ru- like Matsari can't control himself, and he would have said things that he regrets, and that would have poisoned the entire. Like it, it would have created unnecessary drama. I think it was a wise decision. Okay, not to well let's let's come on to the two two in, two incidences that have, have upset um, Napoli. But I see, I've seen what you've tweeted. As I actually see this the opposite way of you, the opposite way to you. But let's go let's go one at a time. So first of all, there's Lautaro before Inter's first goal. There's uh, Napoli feel that there was a foul by Lautaro on Lobotka in the build-up to Chalinoglu goal. Basically, Lautaro passes it on um, to, to a teammate, and then um, uh, uh, 
Lautaro kind of loses his foot in and, and puts his arm around Labocca's waist. Um, and Napoli feel that was a foul. I know that you feel like that was a foul. I, I you yeah, see, I've watched this. I've watched this. Unless I've not seen an angle, I've seen this this incident about four or five times. Unless I'm not seeing an angle, I I definitely see him put his arm around there, but I see very little, virtually no contact, no force at all that would would affect that would cause him to go down. Unless I'm not seeing an angle. Well, he's dragging him down. He's got his arm around he's his waist. He's got his arm around his waist, but does down. he actually put any pressure on him to bring him in? I don't well, see yeah, any. Because he's, so, because he's falling over. And I mean, that, that's the thing. You're not al- Regardless, you're not allowed to have your arm around the torso of your opposition. It's, it's, I don't think it's, he it's makes any contact thing. with him, though. I think he's just kind of just round there, but it's not actually putting any pressure or any... I don't even know if he touches him. So I don't know. That's just what I've seen. Maybe I haven't seen an him. angle, but... <laughs> He's dragging him down, and to me, that's a that's a clear mistake by Massa. That is just he's standing right there mm. too. It's it's not good enough. I'm sorry. It's 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 just simply not good enough um, by Massa to literally be standing there and a player, even though it's a tangled situation. Uh, Lobotka covers the ball with his butt, and Lautaro. Well, it's it's an ice hockey challenge. It's a four checking, and he runs right into it. And covers the ball, but then in order to stop Lobotka, he grabs his arm around his torso and drags him down. That's a free kick. Now, that's just that's just a huge mistake. Now, that's that's just wrong by Massa. Uh, and but 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 again, VAR can't intervene because that's that doesn't fall under under any other categories. There, it's not a you know it's in the middle of the pitch. It's not a you know dog so. It's not a red card offense. It's not anything like that. It's it's a fifty. It's it's a challenge in the middle of the pitch. The referee has full discretion. The VR VAR can't intervene, and that's why this falls entirely on Massa. He made a mistake there. He should have blown his whistle. He's standing there for goodness sakes. Um, so to me, that's just that's just a huge huge mistake by him. Okay, all right. I'm just looking at it again now. I mean, yeah, he puts his arm around him. It, it looks worse on the still than it does on the. But anyway, fair enough. Um, let's move on to the the Ossiman incident. So these were uh, this was at one nil to Inter, um, where um, Napoli feel it was a penalty for Francesco Acerbi clip on Victor Ossiman's heel. Now there's definite contact. The foot, the no foot, and the contact. ankle move. Uh, yeah. The question, no, he, he, the he question is whether it's heavy enough. Um, hmm. I know that you I feel that know. you feel that it isn't. Uh, heavy enough. Morelli, no, I saw him light. say the same thing. He didn't think he thought it was too light. I think yeah. you know my opinion. I think the fresh hold is too severe for light touches in the area. If it was me, the penalties have to be hundred percent penalty. I've said that throughout. I just think that based on what is usually given today, that's a penalty based on what is usually given for contact in the area. Well, no, because they that that's the problem here that we have. Because sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. And that's something that they need to work on. That's something that Rocky and and his his superiors and paymasters they have to sit down with the referees and say, you know, there has to be a little bit more consistently. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't, and and you can't have it like that. It, it creates unnecessary confusion and irritation. That is way way too light of a contact. Uh, Osiman does what every striker does, uh, and 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 is right to do. He feels the contact, he goes down. That's what a striker's job literally is. Um, so I don't, this notion of, oh, Simon dies, blah, blah, blah. No, no, he does what every striker in the world and throughout history has done in that situation. You feel that, you go down. Simple as it gets. Um, the problem is that there's, it's such a light contact and, and Massa's actually really well positioned there. Um, and he sees it and he feels it's not, enough of a, a it's not enough of a contact to to warrant um a, a penalty and, and i think he's actually right there um i i, I just think yeah. in theory i agree because this this is but i just think that based on what is usually given this is usually given as a penalty uh, i mean i, I saw the Ro- and we'll come on to Ro- the roma penalty i mean there's much more contact here than there was on the roma penalty though well you see no because there isn't you know why because again it's about how the contact is there was no i mean i i, well. I did see no, no, zero if you look contact at the roma, on the roma one yeah, but if you if you well, there is one because if you look at when christensen puts his foot down like he sweeps the, the leg, essentially, under him, meaning the impact of the contact ma- matters as well. It's not just the contact itself. It's, again, you have to look at the situation as a whole. The impact of the contact 
that it has on the player. Christensen is 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 is, a, is not as impeded from moving naturally. He's, he's he's putting his foot down and he sweeps the leg, even if it's a. Sl- I agree, it's a it's a lesser contact than than the Acerbi one. But you, you can't tell me the impact of that contact. I, 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 we'll come on to Roma. We'll come on to that incident. I saw no contact that, that, at all. That, that is a stonewall penalty. You can't sweep the leg. I didn't of a see any contact. Penalty. That's the thing. I saw zero contact. Maybe I'm going blind. There is but I saw none. And the, the, no, no, no. There is contact. There is contact. He's Christensen's going past, and he, you know, it's it's a, it's a clumsy and unlucky. I don't think there was any intent behind it, and I've seen that. But he's going past him, and just as he's putting his foot down, he puts his foot under him, which means that he can't. He can't, you know, he impedes him from from making a, a movement, which he's entitled to doing in that situation, and that that's why it's a penalty. It's clumsy defending, and unlucky. But if you look at that situation, it has to be a penalty. Yeah, not for me. But yeah. anyway, but let's move on to let's let's move on to Napoli. What went wrong for Napoli away from these these penalty incidents? Um, as I said before, when 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 I was talking about Inter's defence, um, you know, I thought Napoli were very good with keeping the ball with their pressure. Uh, and their intensity in the first half. Um, unfortunately, they didn't create anything. Um, they created nothing at all. Um, just just a couple of mm. long shots. Um, I thought Inter had this game in 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 control, um, and I think this this game illustrated just all the problems that that Inter have in both phases in the defence. I mean, you mean Napoli, right? Yeah. What did I say? Yeah, said okay. <laughs> all right. Napoli. <laughs> saying, you confused Napoli. me. No, you confused. Like, yeah. what, where are we? Yeah. Okay. Napoli. Yeah. <laughs> This 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 game showed the problems that Napoli have um, in, um, in 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 both phases um, of of the game. Um, I mean, if we talk from the defensive point of view first, Mazzari was supposed to come in and sort out the defence, which was was a mess under 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 Rudy Garcia. We saw all the gaps uh, between each department, uh, how badly they defended, uh, and everything. And Mazzari's come in, and I and I think that there are. You know, he's tightened it up in terms of there aren't those gaping holes uh, in between the two departments. Everything is tighter together. But they've conceded eight goals in three games. And I know the opposition have been yeah, good. I know the opposition have been good, but eight goals in three games. Real Madrid away, four goals. I mean, that, that half of those came against a Real Madrid away goal uh, at the Bernabeu. So I, I think you're being a little bit too harsh um, on, on, on that. But the way when Matsari comes in, what Matsari did the law, what Matsari always does is he provides organization, he provides structure defensively, and then he relies on his attacking players to resolve the issue. And that's what he did. When you say I saw you tweeted out that there were no patterns of play, I think there's a there's a truth with a modification, as we say <laughs> in Sweden. Um yes, there Matsari doesn't really have an attacking structure. But there, the, the fact he he did this with the three tenors as well. He provided a defensive stra- framework, a solid framework, and then he gave the license to those three up front to resolve situations and games. This is what he did with Hricha, Osiman, and Politano too in this game, and also Elmas. Um, it was the problem with that. That is an archaic way of approaching football. That is not a yeah. modern way to approach football, and. And and that's why they kind of, I think that's why they kind of brought him in because they the, I think the calculation was well we do have two world class attackers in Hricha and Osiman that should be enough to see us to the top four and with Matsari basically providing a sort of solidity in defence we should be fine and I think they will be fine in the end so I I think both yes and no there in the sense that there's no patterns of play but we have to give it to I think it's the right thing to do in this situation, to give Hricha and Osiman, and I would love to have seen Raspadori as well from start, to say basically to these guys, okay, you have the license to create the three of you. Do what you want. And then have the rest of the team kind of cover behind them, if you know what I mean, defensively. But I do agree with you that this is not a long-term solution. Absolutely not. Well... Yeah, um, where should we go from? Um, I want to finish off about the top four uh, at the end. So let's let's come on to that. Let's have a look at what wasn't good enough uh, from from, from Napoli. Uh, first of all, Merit. I mean, how much more evidence do we need that this guy is not good enough? He cost he cost Napoli the game against Real Madrid with that dreadful error. Uh, yeah. I mean, what the absolute state of Merit 
in the build up to the second goal when when yes. when they were they're passing it back, messing about with it, they pass it back to him. He's got under virtually no pressure and he just kicks it out of play. Um and then from then eventually uh, eventually into win it back and and uh, um and, and score. But that just kind of just summed up where Merritt is right now. The Napoli left back situation is also a big problem. Uh, you mentioned Claret Scaly there. Mm. We know he likes to cut inside. He's got no one to overlap. Um, I mean, Juan Jesus played there against Real Madrid. was a disaster, unsurprisingly. Natan played there uh, against um, Inter and really, really struggled. But it's kind of unfair on him. It's not his position. I mean, it's not Juan Jesus' position either. So I think that is penalising them. They've got nothing at all going forward. So it's easy to... You know, we said, we're talking about how predictable Napoli were going forward, uh, how easy it was for, for Inter. I mean, Inter defended well. Let's not take anything away from them. Um, but, you know, when you've got one of your side is completely closed down from the fullback area, then it, it's obviously quite difficult. Um, the Napoli defence, as I said, I mean, Ostergaard, uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure he's, he's, he's going to be good enough now. Every single time he plays, uh, Napoli concedes so many, so many goals. Um, but also the, the home record, I mean, it's abysmal this season under both Garcia and, and, and now under, well, Mazzari as well. They've got seven points from 21 points in Serie A this season. One point from two games in the Champions League uh, at home. They've got the fifth worst record in Serie A this season at home. I mean, it's absolutely terrible for, for, for a great stadium that was just such a fortress last season. Um, so that they need to sort that out big time. They have to sort out their home record big time. Otherwise, they are not going to finish in the top four. And I mean, the top four is going to be a battle for them this season. I don't think yeah. that we can expect Napoli to to just waltz in and and, and waltz no. in the top four because on paper, yes. On paper, there's no doubt about it. This is a team that should be finishing the top four comfortably on paper. When any team that's got two world-class attackers, it almost doesn't, like I said before, it almost doesn't matter who the rest of your team is. If you've got two world-class attackers like Ossiman and Claret Skater, how many teams in world football have not one, but two world-class attackers? You can count them on one hand, mm. probably on a few fingers. That's, I mean, that's how yeah. privileged Napoli are to have these. So on paper, even with those two alone, they should have enough to finish in the top four. But when you see the way that they're playing and you see all the problems that they have, um, you know, I've said it before. I think Roma are a big danger to to them, and maybe even to Milan as well um, this season. So Napoli, yeah, they have to be careful. Uh, Napoli, and they play Juventus. No, I, I don't think Milan have anything to worry about. I think Milan will comfortably finish in the top four, and I think Milan aren't even out of the title race. So I think this is a three horse race. Milan will have our let's for, let's not forget they're decimated they're going through a bit of a crisis but they will bounce back and if they're out of the champions league they have one game a week i don't think we can count milan out just yet um this is a three horse race for the title but i agree with you that the the the, the fourth spot is going to be a nail biter between me between roma and, and napoli because roma <laughs> Dybala Lukaku is just as beautiful of a combination that we thought it was going to be. Um, they can resolve any game. That's what I mean. They're they really guaranteeing can. almost as many goals as Quadra, and if not, you know, the, yeah. as, as, as Quadra and uh, it's interesting, Ossima. isn't it? You have these you, exactly. You've got two two great attacks, two attacking duos, great attacking duos going up against each other. Uh, but in the end, I actually I do think that uh, Napoli have. Just too much firepower and are too too good of a team. The thing is, the thing is, I look at the coach as well. I mean, Mourinho. Okay, he's not the Mourinho. He's not the the top top one of the best coaches in the world like he was, you know, five, ten, fifteen years ago. And he is a little bit outdated to an extent. But ask me, who do I trust out of Mourinho or or, or Mazzari? It's Mourinho all day long. He's a winner, uh, and Mm. I trust Mourinho every day of the week and and twice on Sundays. (laughs) <laughs> the, the, you know the over Matsari uh, and, mm. and and it's all on De Laurentiis it's unbelievable what a mess yeah. De Laurentiis has made here the coach I he mean, has managed I mean, to screw he's this he's screwed up, this up he? so badly he's destroyed his, his Mona Lisa he really has I mean he's gone from you know the coach from Spalletti to Garcia to Matsari two coaches who have been completely irrelevant for over half a decade the sporting director with Juntali he didn't sign a centre back and we're seeing that as well how not replacing Kim. He's brought in a rookie, Natan, who could go on, you know, I think he's got some good qualities there that he could go on to become a, an excellent defender. But 
you know, he's not a ready-made replacement for for for, for Kim. Uh, and the alternatives are just totally not good enough. I mean, we're talking about players like, you know, Ostegaard and Juan Jesus. And, um, you know, one of my friends said to me yesterday, I mean, we're, we're talking about Genoa level, he said, Genoa level yeah. centre-backs. And we're trying to talk about no, team yeah. again, trying to get in the top four or, or, or retain the Scudetto. They didn't strengthen the squad, squad, squad enough. He didn't give Claret Scalia a new contract because Claret Scalia is still getting paid McDonald's wages. I mean, it's, it's just ridiculous. <laughs> and then the mess with Ossiman, both the contract and obviously the oh, other stuff with the, with, the, with the social media. And Ossiman was bad again. Twi- twi- I know he's, we can maybe put that down to maybe a little bit of rustiness, but he was bad against Real Madrid when he came on and he was really bad in this game as well. Um, so, you know, there's... there's, 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 there's um, De Laurentiis has, 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 has totally made a mess of this so badly. No, he's made a complete mess of everything, and and it's it's a shame because they have they. Have, I feel that, and I and I keep saying this. I think of all the teams that have won the Scudetto the last three year, four years, Napoli were in the best position to actually create a winning cycle, and they didn't because of the arrogance of De Laurentiis. You know, he believed his own myth. And nothing to me exemplifies and illustrates that more than when he was in talks with Tiago Motta in the summer and Tiago Motta asks him who will be the new sporting director. And he said, what do you mean I'm here? And then Motta said, thanks, I'm going to stay at Bologna. It's just, that that's just arrogance. That's arrogance on his part. And, and now he's paying for it. And Napoli are paying for it. And I think it's a shame. Yeah. I really do. Because I think Napoli had everything there, even without Kim, with a, to create a proper structure. Totally agree with you. The, 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 the nucleus mm-hmm. of the team and the star players to build yeah. around. I mean, yeah. they, they had, they had, they were blessed. Just needed to be they a, were blessed. Yeah. They really were. Yeah, they were. And, and you needed to have just a little bit of diplomacy and a little bit of humility in that situation to go on a run. But, Pride cometh before a fall, right? Yeah, certainly does. Um, right, let's move on to Juventus then. Um, Juventus' winning mentality is is definitely back for me. Mm. They, they win this game 2-1. Um, and you look, that's the biggest takeaway from the game for me. I mean, first of all, they Monza equalised in the 91st minute with a fluke of a goal. And Juventus mm. then goes straight from the kickoff to score the winner with Gatti. That's number one. Number two is earlier in the game, Vlaovic missed a penalty at nil-nil. And from the resultant corner, Rabiot scored instantly, straight away. Um, there's definitely been a mental shift for me since the Sassuolo game. Um, but whatever you feel about the Juventus' quality of their squad, about Allegri's style of, of, of management, the, the, the style of play, blah, blah, blah. The winning mentality is definitely back. You don't, And this isn't the first time recently either. Um, so I, I think that there is... Allegri has really created a a team, let's say, in in terms of mental mm. more than anything else. Wouldn't you yeah. say? Uh, without a doubt, this is Juve. He he knows what Juve Juve is in terms of mentality and how you have to be and behave and blah blah blah. And he's instilled that in this team. Um, this inevitability about you know when when Monza scored, I, I was watching that and I was thinking. Well, you are just going to go now and score the winner in the ninety-fifth minute. Like, it just, it just that's 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 how I felt. You were just looked unfazed. They just drummed on, and we have to be honest. Shocking, shocking defending by Monza. Five players ball watching, including Gagliardini, who made a complete tit of himself. Yeah, what a tit! First going off to Rabiot. And 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 like mocking him for the equaliser, and then, I mean, and then what just... he did after the game as well, where where he he told Rabiot uh, to to well no he was responding to Rabiot. Rabiot put something on social media yeah about respect and blah blah blah, and he made fun of his mum yeah saying you which know is... did your mum say something? did your mum allow you to say that or something like that, which is just childish. But I mean that's that's just serious. That's serious. Well, that's, that's it is serious, but it's also it. like I've said this before. If you've got a player of the quality of Gagliardini, you don't have the right to mock anybody. I've said this. I say this. Like, it always, it always makes me laugh in life when you see people that are untalented, unsuccessful. Mm. And some would say, okay, Gagliardini's done pretty well for himself. <laughs> you know, better than better than, than any of us have in terms of being a footballer. But you know what I mean when you have players that in their mm. in their industry relatively they're unsuccessful. They're untalented. They've never done anything with their life, you know. Um, and, yeah, and then they think that they have the right to, to mock people. Uh, no. Yeah. If you're, I think if you're a success, uh, then you can do it. If you're not, just 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 shut up. 
basically. Well, Ibra used to always say that first you win, then you talk. Exactly. Um, Mourinho, is that what Mourinho, um, did Mourinho say that? Um, well, well, no, Ibra. Ibra said Ibra it, okay. Mourinho's Mourinho always, yeah, I've heard yeah. Mourinho say similar things like yeah, that before as yeah, well. Like yeah, yeah. when, like first you, when win, you can get win, people talk. like Pietro or Monaco having a go at Mourinho, who's won everything. You know, like this is where, <laughs> this is how I feel about Gallardini. Like, you have no right yeah, to mock him. Yeah, he was embarrassing. He embarrassed him. So, but it was funny. I mean, this is Serie A shithousery and, and it's always going to be like that. And Rabiot had to respond. And and and, and then, of course, Gagliardini <laughs> had to make fun of him. Mom, because, Mama of Rabiot. course, Vero, Veronique, Veronique Rabiot is, you know, infamous known for dominating Adrien's uh, life and, 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 and negotiations and so on. But Rabiot has been very good. Uh, not just this last season, but this season as well. Yeah, I mean, I this season he started a little bit more, yeah. a bit slower. But this, 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 this game. I mean, he was man of the match. Um, I mean, he scored, of course, but that assist, that is a, that is a, the kind of thing that a champion does. You know, when you, when you, mm. you know, you've been pegged back at one-one. There's only minutes left. Mm. Uh, almost like an American movie. The end into an American yeah. sports movie, isn't it? <laughs> you know, <laughs> then, you know, it's oh, it looks like it, it's going to be failure. But then your big champion, your hero of the film, comes and and pulls it out of the bag for you. You know, <laughs> oh dear, yeah, yeah, that's it what was, it was like. like you know, he, he went yeah, straight yeah. up, he went straight up the pitch. And, have I said something funny, like boomerish or no, something. Yes, no. you <laughs> You're laughing at me no, like you funny. do when I when I when I. No, no, no. <laughs> just I love how. <laughs> <laughs> it's just funny it's just funny it's just the way you look at things is really really funny to me it's talking about it. like it's like I feel like sometimes when I talk to you I feel like I'm talking to my grand my, my nan when the rest is so like the way that you well, there you go. I stuff. knew it was something to do with being a boomer I knew it was something to do with that I love it it's like the hero of the film came <laughs> like when I was a kid and I used to watch movies with her and I, and I was like oh it's getting stressed up and she's like don't worry this is the star of the film he can't die yeah. <laughs> like she used to say stuff like that <laughs> <laughs> oh my god that's brilliant no but it is like that it, it really was the kind of when you know he was they, they equalized Gagliardini mocked him and instead of losing his you know temper mm. instead he uses and chan- ch- channels that in the best way possible and that to me is very typical of Juve and that's all Allegri Allegri has instilled this kind of men- mentality at Juve and that's yeah. why I think is and Gatti has that speed. mentality as well because we, again you yeah. can look at his technical deficiencies you look at can look at mm. his maybe mm. you know is this a real gonna be a is this a this isn't a top player in terms of natural talent mm. there's no doubt about it I mean mm. but he epitomizes you know this is the second time this season he's he's scored a, a winner uh and he also scored a key winner uh, last season well it didn't end up being key because Juventus went out but he mm. scored in that last yeah. last kick didn't he Again, in the Europa League semi-final um first leg um but you know this is somebody that is making the most out of his out of his talent uh, you know, look where he's come from. Look where he was playing a few years ago in the lower leagues uh, as a part-time footballer, and and you know this is somebody that is you know was humiliated and and trolled you know for what happened against Sassuolo with that own goal, and he's come back so strongly from that. Um, so I think that Gatti is is kind of a symbol, isn't he, of this of this Juve in in many ways, isn't he? It's a Juve that isn't. The yeah, best in terms yeah. of quality, but is mentally become so strong. They are, Gatti is mentally they are, a, he's a warrior mentally. Better than the sum of their parts, and that's all on Allegri. Um to to that he was getting them everything out of this team. Literally every last drop um out of them and building them up mm. mentally to to understand what it means to play at Juve, uh, which he understands better than mo- anyone at the club right now. Yeah, uh, it's 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 no. You got to give credit where credit is due. And the negative and side uh, of all this, of course, is people are going to look at the way that Juventus basically played in their penalty area for the last thirty minutes, um, which I think again you can overdo it. And I think they overdone it a little bit, like they did in the second half against Inter as well. People will look at the thirty-four percent possession um, uh, in this game, which is just not enough against a team like Monza and. You can only go so far playing this way. And I think certainly next season, you know, when they're back in the Champions League, there's no way they're going to be able to play against the top sides in Europe playing this way. But, and I said this in our Q&A uh, episode, which we, which we recorded before the uh, which we recorded before the Monday pod, because we had a question on this. There is a big difference this season between the last two seasons with, with Allegri's Juve, is that while in those last two seasons, the first two seasons of Allegri's return, um, 
you know, Juventus were for most of the time unwatchable, r- ridiculous low possession stats. The big difference is that during those two seasons, Juventus weren't creating barely anything. They had XGs every game of under one, under 0.5 a lot of the time as well. It was just horrible and unsustainable uh, in terms of getting good results. The difference this season is that even though we're still seeing a very low possession for a team that's challenging at the top, I mean, 34%, uh, and we're not seeing the best football still, Juventus are creating chances this season. And in this game, they had an XG of 2.67 against 0.76. Now, you're going to win. You're going to be winning most of your games if you're going to have XG, if this is what's going to be the difference in your XG and your chance creation. That's the difference this season. And while this is the case, while Juventus are playing, are having chance creation like this, I'm not going to complain too much. That's where people misunderstand me about style of play. I'm very mm. much about substance mm. as well. I will not tolerate playing like this if Juventus have an XG of 0.5 and that's what the case was in last season. So I'm not going to be hard on Allegri. Yes, it's not my style of football and I want teams to to, to, to be the, the leaders on the pitch. But you can't... Comp- the Juventus are creating... And this game was the same. Nonza had their first shot on goal in the 91st minute and it wasn't even a shot. It yeah. a cross. No, it was a cross. <laughs> you know, so you can't... The bottom line, you you can't complain this season, uh, so so far. Mm. Well, certainly since the Sassuolo game, you can't complain. Mm. No, you can't. No, I've got nothing more to add. I think you're spot on. The only thing I want to add though, is, uh, mm. I do want to criticise Paladino starting eleven. No attackers. I mean, what was he? Th- what was he thinking? We praised Paladino a lot, but that that was uh, that was bizarre. Um, mm. uh, and it was, and the defence thing mm. towards the end was, was shocking as well. Um, I, I mean, look, we, you know, Paladino, this is his first real job. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, you got to, it's going to take time for him to grow. And I hope he stays at Monza for another season and continues to learn. Um, I, don't, I hope he doesn't go to anywhere big right now because I think that would be too big of a step. I think he should stay there, you know, uh, another season and then maybe take a step up and, and, and gradually learn. I mean, he's a young coach. Yeah. Um, and, and he's a very talented coach. Yeah, I, I, I think he's definitely not, he's definitely. Guys suggests he's not ready for one of the very, very biggest clubs. If he is going to move to a big club next season, maybe it's like a Fiorentina kind of level before he... I would like to see him at Fiorentina. Yeah. That's actually what I was going that to... That kind of me, level, like a kind of sixth, yeah, seventh, I, eighth, I think, fifth, yeah. kind of maybe, Europa League. Where maybe, he gets, yeah. Exactly. That, that's where I want to see him. I don't think he's ready for Roma Lazio. I think that would be too, a step too big too, because I think those t- Piazza, that, that's too... Ooh, those he, He's not ready for that. Mm. Um, I think Fiorentina is, is the right step. Yeah. Um, but but I do like him, but I have to say Di Gregorio again. <laughs> oh, just, yeah. The double save. You know, yeah. I mean, if Inter can get this guy and have him as a backup uh, and, 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 and Calderola as well, they're both like Inter, you know, youth team players and Interisti. Uh, the, the, the Inter are in a good place because there is talk of that as well um, because Aldero is shocking. <laughs> we saw that again. Yeah. Well, we talked God about that in the Q&A as well. Let, you, let, yeah, what, yeah, listen, to, listen to what I said about him watching him um, mm. watching him close up <laughs> training. Um, yeah, it's not, yes. not good at all. Um, yeah. Also, Vlaovic quickly um, missed another penalty. He needs to be taken off penalties for Juventus. Yeah, He's missed I was four say. of his last seven and then I think three of mm. his last four, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, again, he's... he's technical level I really didn't think it was this low his technical level um, even if you see the the miss the, the, the follow up and then there was a miss hit and a good chance in the second half as well he, he miss hits a lot of a lot of his uh, shots sometimes uh, Vlaovic um, yeah. he's not the yeah. cleanest uh, as clean as you think with his technique no. he, he does need to improve it technically um, okay right we're, we're, let, we'll have to start moving faster now so let's move on to Milan um after that disaster against Dortmund, this was a must-win game, uh, and they got mm. it three-one. Again, I, I didn't think <laughs> I didn't think they were that good in, in this game. Certainly, the first half, um, I think Frosinone had the chances to to uh, to take the lead. They missed a one-on-one, didn't they? Cooney missed a one-on-one. Mm. But I think that once mm. Milan got in the lead, they did. They were yeah, they, they were, were pretty comfortable after that, and they definitely deserved to win this game. Um, the positives, Jovic, of course, um, mm, finally. finally scored goal and an assist, a good assist. Yeah. I, I actually thought he was quite good when he came on against uh, Dortmund as yeah. well. He's def- definitely better than Giroud. So that's good. That's good. Let's let's see where... The Milan need him. Milan need all of their squad to be def- to be delivering. They mm. can't afford 
to to not have Jovic, you know, or anyone given this injury situation and and the depth that they, they can't afford to not have players give deliver in important positions. And Jovic has to start doing it. And I'm glad for him because he was a player that I really liked at Frankfurt a couple of years ago. And I hope that this can be the start of something uh, because he, I do think there is a talented player there. I'm just not sure if a one-man attack is what, what... I think he needs to play in a two-man attack. He's the kind of player who strikes me as someone who needs... Similarly to Immobile, in the sense that I think he needs someone closer to him to play off of in order to to score mm. and, and be effective. Um, but I have to give a shout-out to Pulisic. I mean, that was... What a wonderful goal that was. It was it was wonderful, Man-man. the way he took it. Um, the burst mm, and then the finish. It was, um, it was good. And again, gorgeous. much needed after the really poor performance against Dortmund. Um, yeah, it was a great goal. Mm. And Teo Hernandez as well, as a left centre-back, talked about Augusto. Um, yeah. He was a su- 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 surprise success. Um, gives Milan another option there, which was good. Magnon, again, after assist. his disaster against Dortmund, uh, another assist. Three seasons in a row he's got an assist. Um, I saw a funny I saw a funny graphic on social media that he's got more assists than Zaniola this season. <laughs> more goal contributions than Zaniola. Zaniola's got zero goals, zero assists, and is now getting, starting to get hammered now by Aston Villa. After a reasonably bright start, he's, the Villa fans are really onto him now. So Magnon, Magnon is, is creating more than Zaniola. Uh, and Ben Asser returned from injury, which is crucial for Milan. Like you said, if Milan are going to try and get back into the title race and, and be a challenge, I think he, I think he definitely will be will be crucial. Um, so, long way to go for him, obviously, to get back to his best and fit, peak fitness. But that was really, really crucial. And also nice to see Kamada and Chaka Traore come on youngsters because Pioli gets a lot of criticism for not using the youngsters, the young youngsters, the, the academy players enough. Uh, so it was good to see those two come on. Um, I do want to say one thing about Frosinone. Very enjoyable team to watch this season. Lots of talented youngsters. We know they're going to concede a lot, though. And the defending, I'm sorry, the defending on that second goal for Pulisic, as well as he took it, as brilliant as he took it, I'm sorry. At Not even at Serie A level, at professional level, I would say even at Sunday league level, if you're letting in a goal from a straight ball over the top from a, from a goalkeeper, one ball over the top, does the whole defence and puts the player on, on, on goal. I mean, so, I'm sorry. That is just, that's just ridiculous. That's, Eusebio that's Di Francesco de- things. Eusebio Di Francesco is going to Eusebio Di that's, Francesco. I'm sorry, I mean. that's pub defence. That is pub defence. <laughs> I would take off my, if I was a coach at Sunday League, at pub level, even if it was a, a charity game, I would take off the <laughs> centre-back. The centre back. No, it's, it's, it's not the centre back. It's the Francesco. The, he doesn't believe in defending. Him and Vincenzo Italiano. They 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 don't believe in defending. Like it's just, and they get exposed when when they have it. You know, when when it works, it's because they have fantastic attacking players who resolve situations, and it kind of masks over the glaring holes of their ta- of their tactical defensive deficiencies. But then they go up against great teams or bigger teams and better teams, and it's all mask unmasked for everyone to see. It's it's horrific. It's it's pub defending because he is tactically defensively a pub pub team coach, mm-hmm. um, and we've seen it consistently throughout his career. But I'm glad that he's doing well in the sense of in the attacking phase because I do think he has things he can teach players. I think Sule is a fantastic example of that, um, that he can develop players going forward. But this is his level. He should be at a Frosinone. He should be at a Empoli. You know, that's the level he should be at. And and, and we saw that uh, uh, once again against Milan where, where the defending was just... It was laughable. I laughed when I saw some of the defending when I was watching that game. I just burst out laughing. It's it's not it's not even just it's not even naive it's not even it's just it's just shocking to this level to not be able to like what do you do seven days a week if you can't organise your players better to defend than that no no terrible Bam. um just a quick reaction what did you make of the Maldini interview um that he did on on Friday because <laughs> I'll, I'll try and sum this up really really quickly because we we are going way over as usual um so he gave a he gave a long interview a damning interview talking about his sacking um by Milan in the summer. He hadn't said anything since then. Uh, he'd been very gentlemanly, but he finally spoke out about it. He talked about how he was sacked. He said that Cardinale uh, basically was was telling fibs about the kind of the reasons why why he subbed, uh, kind of used a bad relationship with Giorgio Frullani, the CEO that Maldini supposedly had, and said that 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 was a lie. Basically, he said he was disrespected um, by by Cardinale, but he didn't want to bring a lawsuit 
against them like Boban did because of you know how much love he has for Milan and the fans. He denied being an individualist, which is another criticism that was put against him that he kind of wasn't a team a team man, a team player. Maldini. Um, he said that Maldini also said the decision to sack him was already made months before, and he hinted that that Cardinale actually probably wanted to sack him as soon as he came in, but was unable to mm. do that because they just won the Scudetto. Uh, and he also slammed Cardinale for not for not even replying to it to a to a three year plan that Maldini put together, uh, in which he said he'd need three years to win the Champions League, uh, and he put a three year plan together, and and Cardinale didn't even read it or reply to it. He also said that it was unfair to 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 to, to, to blame uh, Maldini for the Ketele signing failure because you know he says that you know if you sign thirty five players uh, you know you're going to get a failure and especially with the young so it's going to happen. He said he would have been against selling Tonali uh, and also said that the club didn't want to sign Tonali when Maldini signed him uh, and he also slammed. The president Scaroni slammed Gazidis and Fulani for being absent at times of difficulty and for leaving games early in order to in order to uh, get home for the traffic. So pretty damning interview, wasn't it, uh, Nima? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I read that and I was like, okay. Um, so Paolo Maldini decided to unleash hell. Um, it's just it was it was one of the most astonishing interviews I think I've ever read in Italian football. I don't, I can't remember someone formerly at Milan, Inter or Juve ever, ever expressing himself like this. He was, he was not holding back. He let fly on this Milan and he made it abundantly clear that he does. He feels betrayed by them. That he was unhappy when he was there. That he'd done everything for Milan. At, at um, you know, he he's been quiet because he loves Milan. The the you know his 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 loyalty to the club, to the fans, to all of that stuff, and that he wasn't going to take it. And the fact that he comes with this in this moment and just empties his arsenal of nukes because that's what they are. This is, it's it's astonishing, um, the the stuff he says, and how he just unloads on this management, is 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 remarkable, um, and and I and, and the way that he does it too is clearly because he feels so disrespected on a professional level, mm. um, and I think that's what's hurt him the most, you know. Him, you know, and he didn't say anything for six, seven months, or however months, however many months it's been. Mm. But you wait for the fact that he's the Champions League before doing it. (laughs) Well, (laughs) well, I think it's also because he didn't want to to be a situation where they say you're speaking out of the heat of the moment. Because Mm. you know, he 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 knew what he wanted to say with this, and it's remarkable because I can't remember any director at any point off the top of my head at Milan, Juve, Inter, leaving the club and and unloading on the ownership like this, mm. in this manner, in this detailed, long, disc- just, em- like, basically, tell-all. Yeah. Like, it was it was truly shocking. And it's, it's going to be interesting because um, how do Milan handle this? Because, you know, okay, so... There's talk of bringing Ibrahimovic back into the club. Does that happen? Um, if it doesn't happen, how do you know? And, and things go badly on the pitch. You know, I, I think this is this is a precarious moment for Jerry Cardinale and his entire and the credibility of his project, because to have Maldini, someone like Maldini, who did an amazing job at Milan as a director, come out and just unload this way and basically say ever since the first day this guy came in he's been a clown he doesn't know what he's doing um he's just a poser none of them really care about Milan I mean all of these these are all things he's implying um and and that he's not going to have his professionalism questioned and blah 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 this this is Paolo Maldini talking 
you know yeah this is this yeah. is not just something I mean, so far they've said nothing uh, I, I i well that's the best way to handle it yeah that's the they they, they can't say anything mm. they they just have to be quiet about it not to say a word i think that would be the wisest decision at this point is to just let this die out mm. don't just ignore it because you do not regardless of who you are unless you're silvio berlusconi you do not or Adriano Galliani, or Ariado Braida, you do not go into a open war of words with Paolo Maldini at Milan. If you do that, that is a battle you are going to lose. Yes. So No, totally it's... agreed. Ag- agreed. They're, 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 the only way they can win this is by having a successful season and then yeah. and the signings that they made um, being successful yeah. and then they can yeah. come back and say, look, you know, well, it was the right mm. it was the right decision. That's the only way that, yeah. that that you can win, really. But regardless yeah. of that, yeah. it was handled so badly at the time um, that, that, it was. that that even we that won't repair. Even too. that won't repair. You just, you just do not treat somebody like that in the way that they, um, you know, the, the way that he was dismissed. Um, okay, mm. right. We're gonna have to go through the other games pretty quickly. So starting off with Roma, um, they another late comeback, another Roma late show. They score so many late goals, don't they? They win two one at Sassuolo. Two goals in the last fifteen minutes um, just shows just the spirit that Mourinho has has installed in this mm. team. If nothing else, they, mm. they they I mean, there's no coincidence how many late goals they score. Um, as I said before, I don't think it was a penalty. I think that, that certainly they things went their way this game. The red card, which was a red card, uh, you know, if that hadn't happened, that red card, maybe Sassuolo would have gone on to to win this game again. But I feel like the, when Sassuolo scored, it went against a runner play. I thought Roma were the better side. They were in control, um, yeah. They were in control. But having mm. been 1 0 ahead, you know, 30 mm. minutes to go. That's fair. That's I fair. mean, that's fair. Yeah. That but were, Lukaku was, was not good Lukaku this was game. terrible oh this game, my yeah. God. Oh my God. When he's having one of those days when he's La Caca <laughs> and he was La Caca was on La Caca. steroids. Yeah. He was La Caca on steroids against Sassolo and it was just shocking. And I think Mourinho was like, yeah, you just take him off. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Mm. Like, this is not going to work. Um, but no, like you said, the, the biggest takeaway, I think, is again, Mourinho and Allegri, you know, when you instill a winning mentality, you come back and you win late. Um, that, that's the hallmark of, of, of building a team with character and, and a big team mentality. And I think what what he's doing now is is, is actually pretty impressive. I mean, he's challenging Roma, uh, Napoli for fourth. They're qualified from the Europa League group. I, I still think that they are they can win the Europa League. I keep saying that. I think they have a they have a good position. You know, if they of course lucky with the draw as well because there's some really good teams in the Europa League this season. But they are they are thereabouts, and I think they can go a long way because uh, I don't think they'll finish in the top four. I think Napoli are just too good. But the fact that they are pushing Napoli for that fourth spot is really impressive. Yeah, no, I agree. I think they're going to be a definite threat. They've got too much quality uh, in attack, too many goals in the team, uh, and like I said, you know, I trust Mourinho um, over <laughs> over Mazzari for sure. And they're in excellent form. Mm. They won six of the last eight. Um, the games and I thought Dybala again mm. was, was we saw the magic that he has um, the, the, he scored the penalty he had a couple of damage levels, but the, the back heel the genius back heel for Christensen mm. I mean it's a lucky goal such a lucky winner but the yeah. the, the genius back heel makes that out, out, out of nothing um, so nice. Dybala is, yeah. Dybala is Dybala yeah still great to watch isn't he he's still great to watch if mm. he can just stay fit um, Lazio get an important win as well um, dominant Dominant in this game uh, again, which is, is good. They've had two dominant wins in a row, two games where they've created lots of opportunities. Um, okay, Celtic and Cagliari are not the strongest opposition, um, but uh, but they they they, they deserve to win. Um, they had an xG of over, I think, two point five again in this game, which was the same as against Celtic. Um, mm. So they deserve to win. Cagliari basically did nothing until injury time, no. when Providel made two big saves in injury time. From Pavoletti mm-hmm. and then Oristania. I, that's one thing I like about Providel. He's the kind of unflappable goalkeeper who can do nothing, have nothing to do all game, but then always be ready. He's very, he seems like a very mm. concentrated, kind of rigid, maybe that's the Russian in him, kind of goalkeeper. You know, <laughs> Jesus. the Russian yeah. in him. You know what I mean? Like, like he's not, he's very cool, very. Mm. Very calm, very. I, I like that about him. He, he reminds me yeah. a little bit no, of. Um, um, I mean, he's not as good as him, but you know, reminds me a bit of like David Seaman. 
like that very mm. kind of very safe, stable kind of goalkeeper. Yeah. Um, calm, yeah, the mentality, calm in, the calm, calm kind of, influence yeah. on the players around him, kind of. I like yeah, that. He does that. That he one hundred percent does. I agree with that. Yeah. He has a calming presence. He does. He really has a calming presence, and it's good. It was important for Lazio to do this. I mean, now they're through in the Champions League. This this was a very important week mm. for 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 Lazio and Sarri. And it, it to me, I I look at it given what Sarri said last week and then this reaction that suggests to me that he's got the support of the players they don't want him out mm. you know when he said look maybe i should leave and they're like nope no 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 we're, we're behind you and and they they all kind of snapped out of it but it's they're still not out of the woods they're not out of the woods no but it's been work. very like I, i'm trying to think um, you know it hasn't been too many times this season if at all though they've had two games in a row where they've been good in two games uh, and got mm. results as well uh, one after the other, it's kind of been so stop start. One game, oh, is this the turning point? And the next game, they they, they don't. So mm. I think this was important. Yeah. And Pedro as well, shout out to give a shout out to him. Still going at thirty six, still scoring. Um, I mean, he's had an amazing mm. career. And also, I don't know the Lazio defense in the last two games miss, without Romagnoli and Casale, with our friend Patrick and 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 mm. Gila. I don't know. I mean. They are definitely quicker. They've definitely got more athletic than Romagnoli and Casale. So I don't know. Stop investing in Patrick stocks. It's going <laughs> to yeah. end badly. Yeah. It's like investing in Enron. Well, don't. <laughs> now is the time to invest. Um, yeah. <laughs> now is not that it's never, it's not really time to invest in Patrick stocks no. ever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's, uh, look, yes, they are playing well. All jokes aside, Lazio take two wins. Mm. They concede nothing. It's important for Lazio. Mm. It's really right. important. Rest of the other Serie A yeah. results. Genoa won, Empoli won, Lecce won, Bologna won. Bologna, watch this game. Bologna will be kicking themselves. They were so dominant, chance after chance to, to, to wrap this up. And they would have gone, I think they might have gone joint fourth or one point behind fourth. Yeah, they would. I think they would have gone joint fourth, actually, if they'd have, if they'd have won this game. They conceded in the, the last minute of, in, last kick of the game, actually, with a with a, with a, mm. a penalty. Talking about goalkeepers like Providell. Um being important in the opposition box. Uh, the penalty was yeah, won Falcone. by Falcone, the goalkeeper, who, who went up. Um, and then Fiorentina won 3-0. They battered Soleni Turner in that game. Beltran scored his first Serie A goal. Uh, and then Udinese 3, Verona 3. What a game and what a goal by Ngongon. Mm-hmm. Ngongon. Ngong. I don't know how to yes, pronounce his name. If it's Ngong it. or Ngongon. Yeah. No, I don't know. I've, 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 I'm waiting on someone to speak to him and ask him how to pronounce his name because I've heard Ngonge mm. and I've heard Ngonge and I don't know which one it is. Yeah. So, I that don't was know. A, that was a Honestly, great game. And Udinese were kicking themselves as well conceding a, a, a late goal because they haven't no, got too many wins this season. Torino Atalanta play on Monday. Um, Schemacher mm. injured until 2024. I want to talk about him on mm. Thursday's show because this mm. is uh, getting a bit worrying now. Mm. Um, okay, mm. right. Before we finish off with our Badjo Prem face and a new segment, Euro 2024 draw. Let's react to the draw, shall we? Uh, Italy get a very tough draw. They're in Group B with Spain, Croatia and Albania. Uh, their opening game is on June the 15th against Albania in Dortmund. Then they play Spain on the June the 20th in Gelsenkirchen. And then they play Croatia as the final group game. In uh, on June the twenty fourth, um, what's your just immediate reaction just to the the group draw? First of all, the second toughest group they that they could have gotten. Um, I wanted to avoid Group D because Netherlands, Austria, France would have been a nightmare. Uh, but this is not that much easier. Um, it's it's easier, but it's still the second most difficult group they could have gotten. Um, um, I don't like the fact that they play their opening game against Albania. I would have preferred if they played Spain or Croatia in the opening game to get that out of the way because now they have to get they have to beat Albania in that opening game. Um, and if they don't, they will be in trouble. Um, and I don't like that about I don't trust this Italy enough to see them uh, chase. Against Spain, you know, I don't want them going into a game against Spain and chasing and exposing themselves and allowing Spain to destroy them on the counter. So, I hope the, the, I think Italy's fate will be decided in that opening game against Albania. They have to win that. It's as simple as that. Croatia are, are so difficult as well. Uh, Spain are not as good as they were a few years ago. 
uh, but they're still a good side. It's a difficult one. It's a very, very difficult group. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, it is. It is a difficult group. Um, it's also in. And I look at this Group E, and it pisses me <laughs> off. I mean, what is the, the state of Group E? <laughs> Belgium, Slovakia, Romania. I mean, come on. Yeah. <sighs> no, I know. I know. It's not good, is it? Um, I mean, it's interesting. I think the 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 group itself is. It's going to be tough. We know the quality of Spain and Croatia. Um, closest to the time, we'll 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 do a more in depth uh, uh, analysis of of, um, of of all these teams. But um, I mean, Croatia have they're, they're one of the most experienced teams, um, in the, in, and they always. I mean, look at look how well they've done in the last two World Cups, um, final, semi final. That special midfield still has one more midfield, one more tournament left in them. Brozovic, oh, it does. Kovacic, it and of does. course Luka Modric, who's still playing at an insanely high level. Um, mm. Guardiol, Guardiol at the back, of course, although he hasn't been doing amazingly well at City. Um, maybe lack a little bit in attack, Croatia. But the worst thing about Croatia is they are our bogey team, Italy. Italy struggle against Croatia all the time. I think Italy have only beaten them once in their history. Um, mm. in about like over 10 games or something around that number of games. They have such a bad record against Croatia. Um, so they always worry me. Um, Spain, of course, they've got a really special midfield, amazing midfield, although they might not have Gavi for the tournament because he's done his ACL. Yeah, um, I saw that. And Pedri's always injured as well. So Italy could do with, with him being injured. But obviously, Rodri, amazing player. Um, they've got, you know, they've got quality in attack. Moretta's having a great season. So they're always going to be difficult. Uh, and then Albania, you know, they're, 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 there's a lot of Serie A connection there, isn't there? It's almost like a derby, the Albania game. I was going to say, Albania are essentially a mid-table Serie A side. Yeah. So they know Italy inside mm. out. Uh, that's not going to be a walk in the park for Italy at all. No. Um, so Italy need to come switched on. And I think they will. I think now, between now and, and, and the Euros, uh, Spalletti needs to really start rubbing that head and uh and and getting his uh, his shit together mm. for that tournament because i think the the being there is is great but for me and i keep saying this the road to the world cup and winning the world cup in 2026 which i think it, italy should has a, have a mount a serious challenge it starts now um i don't really care about the euros um if i'm perfectly honest for me it's about the world cup italy have to get a result at the world cup um, not win it necessarily, but they have to get there and they have to go far. Italy as a country, Italian football needs this. So, you know, having won the Euros. So I want to see him really start to lay the lay a two-year pl- plan, a two-year, you know, a project towards that. And I want it to start with the Euros as well to, to show what, Italian football is and what his his Italy is um, going you know going forward and that it starts against Albania they have to be no that's, a, that's an absolute must win game that's a must win game they have to go into those last two games at least with three points uh, yeah. on the board otherwise there is the risk of going out the good thing is that you know remember there is the safety net that four of the six third, or third place teams qualify so yeah. you know you finish third you've got a good chance of of uh, of qualifying yeah. if you at least win one of your games, um, mm. and uh, so that that is important when you're in a, such a tough group like Italy are are, are in. Mm. Then if Italy, I mean, you, you, we shouldn't look too far past the group, but mm. the route obviously depending on how far Italy think they can go, the, the the route is important. The knockout route is important. Now, if Italy win the group, they play a third place team from groups A, D, E, or F. Um, so it winning the group could be could be absolutely well would be absolutely massive for Italy, and I'll tell you why, because they would then probably play the winner of the Germany group in the quarterfinals, um, which isn't which isn't too bad. Uh, Germany, of course, will always be difficult because they got home and it's, it's in Germany and it's in Germany, of so... course. But you know this isn't a, this isn't a top Germany team. Um, but the most important thing of winning the group is that they would almost certainly miss England and France till the final. 
if the, assuming England and if England and if Italy win their group and England and France win their groups, which you'd expect them to do, then um, Italy can't meet either England or France till the final. Now, if you've really got ambitions to go all the way, and I think Italy were probably a little bit short of having the quality to go all the way, but mm. let's say we, we want to go all the way and win this tournament, then missing England and France till the final really gives you an opportunity to... To, 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 to get, get to the final, final, doesn't it? Because I've said before, <laughs> I think Italy can fight it out with any other team it's other than England and France, who I think are a little bit Agreed. above them. So winning the, Italy need to go out to win the group, uh, I think. If they were to come Agreed. second, though, Nimmer, they would play the runner-up of Group A. So that's the Germany, Which Scotland, is Germany. Hungary, Switzerland group. So that's not too bad, assuming Germany win the group. You'd take a, yeah, a second-round game win against Scot- uh, a last 16 game against Scotland, Hungary, Switzerland uh, you know, in a major yeah. tournament. No, I, no worries whatsoever. Yeah. But then you play the winner of Group France. C or third-place team in the quarters, and that's well, going to be England. England. So this is where... Where you finish in the where, where you finish is important. Then, if they were to beat England, they would then play likely play France in the semis, assuming France win their group and then yeah. win their then their knockout games. So again, better to come top. If Italy were to qualify as a best third place team, they would play either the winner of Group F or the winner of uh, of Group E uh, in the. In the in the last sixteen, um, that would be probably Portugal or Belgium um, in the in the la- in the last uh, sixteen, and then after that, it, it, it's impossible to predict. Um, I mean, it's quite hard mm. to predict full stop because you know France might not win their so group. It doesn't not. always go the way you that you think it is. England might not win their group; they might come second. You know, so England are winning their group. Hmm? I <laughs> I think England I think they'll win their group. group. But you, do you know what I mean? You can never really you mm. can never really well, you never map these things out. Properly, but you look. Like, if Jude Bellingham or Harry Kane are injured, or if Mbappe misses the tournament for France, or you, you know, yeah, you, you Dusan Vlaovic happen. turns into Fiorentina Vlaovic, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's you never know, you never know. But I think that look, Group C and I mean England, have, England have got the best best draw. There's no doubt about it. Mm, um, they've no got a, a group stage for sure. No, but if you look at their route, England, if they if England win the group. They can't meet a, a, a another group winner until the semi-finals. <laughs> so it's just, well, it's just, uh, you know, England seem to get the. I mean, the last few tournaments, England have had such good draws in terms of the routes to the to the latter stages, and it, you know, well, the last Euros for sure. I mean, and the World I, Cup I just, as well. They didn't play yeah, anyone in the yeah. World Cup. Um, yeah. You know, it's just no. No, so the, the Euros for me was a, the Denmark route to the to the semi was just, just it's, UEFA do these things. What are you going to do? Yeah. It's, it UEFA will it UEFA. I think, um, right, UEFA will UEFA. Badjo and let's do Badjo and Prem face of the week. Okay, so who we got for Badjo this week, Nima? I've got a f- couple. Luko Yanis left footed free kick, mm-hmm. absolutely stunning for Bologna. Cyril Ngonge or Ngonge, uh, stunning. Uh, ba- bicycle kick and Sotil for Fiorentina. What a goal! Uh, three magical goals. Oh, yeah, Sotil. Yeah, of course. Gosh, yeah, I forgot to mention him. Yeah, that's his first goal in uh, I don't know. I think since COVID times. I think. <laughs> <Or something>. mm. <laughs> He's, uh, yeah, yeah. I jinxed him, didn't I? I was there was me slagging him off last week, <laughs> and, he, and he's, he scores a goal like that. I mean, yeah. Let's see how many times he does that again. Um, Okay, all right, that's that's good. I'll go with all of those. Prem face of the week, um, ESPN again. I mean, it's quite a few. Yeah, well, yeah, there's quite a few. Uh, well, I can't I can't remember what they said now again. It was uh, it it was more the way they did it than what they than what they said. So it was um, they they were talking about uh, who the the, the 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 they were ranking the the top. Um, contenders to win the Champions League. They were ranking them. First was, everybody kind of said Manchester City, then by Real Madrid and Bayern Munich were kind of second and third for everyone. And then Don Hutchinson. Um, well, Don Hutchinson was the one who, who said no. He, yeah, he, he okay. Yeah. Don Hutchinson come yeah. out and said, Inter. Inter are going to, yeah, are my fourth, fourth, fourth in my rankings. Immediately yeah. after saying that, the whole ESPN studio crew, Craig Burley. they just all burst. He, they he just really burst out laughing like 
just just such ignorant idiots. Like just they just mm. burst out laughing like so disrespectfully the way that they laughed. It was just like <laughs> so you know, mock- like they were mocking Don <laughs> for the way that he said it. Yeah. Like what you know, like it was it was just didn't Craig was it Craig Burley or Steve Nichols? Who said I don't think it was Steve Nichols. It was Scotland the, the host, Africa. um forgotten yeah. his name, the the, the the English host. Um then it was Burley and and um the 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 South American guy, I've forgotten his name. No, oh, yeah, Alejandro That's Moreno. Moreno. Oh. And but the way yeah. that they were just laughing and mocking him, like mm. you know, Inter, <laughs> you know, like you know, like it was such a ridiculous thing to say. And then Don Hutchinson, but that Don Hutchinson Moreno comes across guy, as such a lovely. He comes across him. as such a lovely guy, uh, he but he really loves his Italian football. But he also he like he knows his stuff. Not just he's not just about Italian football. Like he knows his English football. He watches no. his football all around Europe. Like he he he. He's knowledgeable and he's good tactically. And he actually understands the game. He actually makes an effort to learn. I actually think he's, he's I like listening to him and commentary as a Yeah, as a, and he seems a like a really player. genuinely good guy as well. And these yeah. other guys were just being assholes. They were just being dicks. And and I just yeah, they and, and they were laughing and they were like, Inter? You know, how can you say Inter? I think the guy says, How can you say Inter? What, what are you talking about? And Don's like, Well, uh, they got to the semi They got to the final last season, and they're a better team now. Uh, and yeah, you know, I think they're, they're the best team in Italy. And then he started like explaining why he thought he what he did. And yeah, and they were and like, "What you would just... you would put Inter ahead of Arsenal?" I mean, like, I mean, it's like, like the way the, the way they talk about these things. It's just hot. Oh, like, they, they, like it's you've said the most outrageous thing, and then reality hits, and and it's just, it's just, yeah, it's like rinse and repeat. It's like Groundhog Day with these guys. Uh, Do you know, what I've, I mean? seen seen never, I've seen it in the media. I've seen it in the media so learn. much. And it's, it's, it's these people are so. It's like an echo chamber of programmed mm. prem face robots that's what they are yeah you know and it, yeah. and it's just the way that they were laughing mocking it was like public no, but, it was no, like it's, public it's school mocking you know yeah it's it's condescending condescending it, is the word yeah yeah it's so condescending and it's it's like i remember ale moreno i, I mean how that i honestly believe with him if you every time he says something with conviction and 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 definitively you know that the 180 degree opposite is true <laughs> the man the man is l- consistently wrong about everything any time he makes a prediction i remember him when when conte bought when inter signed lukaku and the way he was mocking conte huh, he wants to play lukaku who wants to play him with his back against the goal ha, ha, ha. <laughs> and he was like yeah that that ended well didn't it ale Amigo, it's like you know he is, he, he's he is an idiot. He really is an idiot. Um, and 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 it's just I find him so such a funny, funny character. The problem with Craig the ESPN Burden. studio crew is they're just they're just like I said, like Nickel Ronnie was. It's just they're just proud to be ignorant. They're just proud. They're just and proud of stupidity. Yeah, they're proud. Yeah. Proud to be dumb. Proud mm. to not to know the answer to your question. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, pr- ignorant. Yeah, uh, it's it's silly, uh, but but yeah, no, it's it's always. Uh, it's Who always else have like we got then on, on Prem Face? I had so many this week. Um, so Claudio Calturuccio, our friend of the show and 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 uh, Patreon, he said that um, BBC Breakfast, which is like the the main um, BBC news program, um, were calling Immobile Ciro Immobile, and apparently <laughs> Talk Sport did the Zero. same all morning. Ciro, Ciro Immobile. Zero. <laughs> Zero Immobile producing two moments of, of Catenaccio. <laughs> what is it with Immobile that the Catenaccio and Ciro? And it's like, <laughs> yeah. Then we had, then we had your good old friend, uh, Adam Crafton, mm. from the, uh, where's he worked for? Athletic, isn't it? Um, saying that Newcastle yeah. are a much better team than Milan so that they will win. Um, in the, in he, he had a really, he had a fantastic one as well, which is, I, this guy is just so stupid. He, he tweeted out a very quiet rainbow laces this year from men's football on an issue that requires conversation for progress. Hard to resist conclusion that events in Qatar last year, armband gate and possibility of Saudi league money and backlash rendering men's game even more cautious to speak. Okay. So it's Saudi and Qatar's fault for the EPL and UEFA and FIFA not doing what he thinks they should be doing. Instead of criticizing the people in power, he goes after uh, two countries for being, for just recently emerging as powers in football. 
it's astonishingly stupid. It's always those bloody Muslims, isn't it, Adam? Always those Muslims. Uh, it's, I'm, t- I'm fed up with this guy. He's an idiot. Let's be honest. We're talking about a bigoted twat, and, and it's disgusting. I'm tired. So of that it. you really feel disgusted? Nah, it's, it's it's disgusting. It's it's disgusting. He's a bigot. It's what he is. He's an Islamophobic bigot, and I, and it just it's nonstop with this guy, and and it's just gross, and 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 it's pathetic, and it's repetitive, and ugh. That's that's yeah. just what I feel. Yeah. I just want to. Yeah. Uh, like that's also we had Steve McManaman during the Napoli Real Madrid game saying that uh, Ossiman <laughs> will want to leave Real will want to leave Napoli now because he wasn't starting the game against against Real Madrid, uh, even though he was just coming back from a from a <laughs> serious injury. <laughs> so that was pretty funny. And uh, also, my dad told me a couple as well. Because he, he, cause my dad's obviously seen me film some of these Cole from Bedford um, parodies of, 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 you know, the Prem face. Uh, and, he, and he said to me, oh, I can see why you, you do that, that, that character, you know, taking the piss out of the Prem faces. Because I was just uh, listening on the radio to uh, Manchester City against Leipzig. He was, on, he was in the car listening to Man City against Leipzig on, on BBC Radio 5 Live. And he said, the, uh, no, no, it was, no, no, yeah, it was Manchester City versus Leipzig and also uh, Manchester United against Galatasaray. And he said they were going from game to game and he goes, they were repeatedly pronouncing Icardi's name as Icardi the whole way through. <laughs> I love and, that. I love and that. He says that Icardi. And he says that they were calling Angelino, uh, Angelino. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the whole way through, he said, and he was like, "What is wrong with these?" Was, that, was it a parody? Was he? Was he? Was it like? Was he just having a laugh? No, no, no. Was this was BBC like, Radio Five Live, the, 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 the most respected like radio radio station in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Angelino, <laughs> gotta be come on, oh. Icardi. I love Icardi. It's like it's like I don't know if if, if Apple developed a football player, the Icardi. Yeah, Icardi. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, but yeah, and we also had uh, we had a couple of sent in, didn't we? Ernesto Carnaval, our patron, said CBS Sports having the Spezia logo up for Benfica. <laughs> <laughs> Just I don't know why I found the playing so like funny. Spezia in the in the in the Champions League this season. That's for sure. <laughs> Maybe that's what yeah. it was. Maybe it was someone being bitchy. And they put on the screen uh, no, Henrik Mkhitaryan when Di, Mar- Di Marco came in. Yeah, God. apparently. A lot of prem faces this I, week. Yeah. There always is yeah, when there's maybe. Champions League weeks. It's just you're guaranteed. Mm. There's, just, there's there's always billions of prem, face, uh, prem, fa- prem faces to pick from. Right. Uh, Kate, finally, just to finish off, um, we haven't, we haven't finalised an actual name uh, for this in terms of what we're going to go for but we've got one for now and we're going to call it Serie, Serie Ass of the Week right now we, we, we <laughs> might change that because we've got a lot of I put out a tweet asking for suggestions of what we should call this segment and we've had some some really really good ones um, but at the moment we're going to call it Serie Ass of the Week and basically it's, it's ass of yeah, the, the Ass of the Week <laughs> and basically Serie it's ass. going to um, be a segment where we make fun of um, the, the social media account of Serie A and also the Italian club. So we won't just pick on the the, 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 the Serie A official account. Um, we'll also pick out um, Italian clubs. And what it will be is everybody that listens to the show, listens to me, know that I always go on, bang on and on about how Italians, how bad Italians are at marketing Serie A, how they just, they're just clueless. They just do not get marketing and i always say that they couldn't sell a life jacket on the titanic and actually that was one of the suggestions for what we should call this segment is can't sell a life jacket on the titanic was was going to be the segment but you know we'll see um so what we're going to do is we're going to pick out tweets social media posts by the serie a and by the clubs which just basically market the league badly and just basically mess up the league even more than it already is um so the the first one is going to be juventus it's going to be Juventus for a post. And this is just unbelievable. But it's, it isn't unbelievable, but it is unbelievable. It's not. It's just you know that, absolutely you know insane how they can do this. So uh, last week, um, basically one of the biggest mass murderers in the history of humanity died. His name is Henry Kissinger, <laughs> who was by very, very conservative estimates. And I mean very, very conservative. The, the number is much, much higher in reality. If we're talking not just directly, but indirectly, the number of people he is responsible for the deaths of. But conservative estimates have it at three to four million. He's committed war crimes in more than a dozen countries. 
Uh, he's con- considered a war criminal in so many nations. He's not allowed, he wasn't allowed uh, in so many nations around the world because of what he did. Um, Juventus put out a post uh, honouring him, basically calling him like well, a friend of, uh, you know, a friend well, of Italian football. Friend. and. And he was a friend of Juve and the Agnelli family, and that's what that's what I'm like. I'm not surprised by this at all. I actually expected this. I'm I'm surprised. It's surprised it took so long. If you know how how good friends Gianni Agnelli and him were, and I mean good friends. No, no, they were virtually best friends. They used to talk on. The, they were best friends. They used to talk on the phone a few times a week. Um, they used to see each other. One of the first gigs Lapo Elcan had as when he started out his career was a personal secretary to Henry Kissinger. Like he is a close bosom buddy of the Agnelli family. And so for me, this was not shocking or surprising. This was just, I knew they were going to do it. I'm surprised. I think they just didn't know whether, when, if they were, you know, I'm surprised it took so long. This, 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 I can tell you where this order came from. This order came directly from John Elkan. Directly With from no John Elkan, this this came no doubt. because because even the, the the idiots that run these social media accounts uh, at, at many of these <laughs> Italian clubs would were not stupid enough to to put out a post like this. So this is an order that's come directly from 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 from. from, from. But it's it's such a typically tone deaf thing, isn't it? It's serious ass. It really is serious ass. You have to be an ass to to do something like this and and not read the room and just. It's 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 to go out this hard and a friend and blah blah blah. Like, there's no need to do that. You can do it on your personal I mean, social insane. media. There was no need to involve Juve in that. There's literally no need to do that. And and it's just it's typically Serie A. It's like when Torino oh, that photo God, that of Kevin Spacey yeah. and Kai, yeah, Urban Kyle. Yeah, but he was. You have to. You know, he sorry, was alleged, acquitted. Alleged. Sorry. Yeah, and he was acquitted. He was acquitted mm. of all charges. But again, the the moment when that photo was posted. He uh, he was still under investigation. The tr- criminal trial was going on, and Torino Urbano Cairo. Po- I mean, it's just posting a photo of him and no, it's insane. Um, it's insane. Kevin I mean, what's Spacey next? of all people for no reason. What's next? It's just, I mean, it's classic Serie A ass. No, it's, it's like, like Schalke. It's, put, it's like Schalke putting out a post uh, honoring Adolf Hitler's birthday. You know, I mean, it's 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 just like. <laughs> I mean, it's insane. Oh, it's just, it's so stupid. It, it's its just dumb and, and it's unnecessary. It's typically serious ass. Serious ass. Dude. It's just, this is what it's I mean. This is what I mean about the marketing. Just, it's just how we kill ourselves. We we could not sell a life jacket in the Titanic. <laughs> worse, in fact. No, worse. We would have, the people would be in the pool and Serie A would come along and take the life jackets off them while, while they're in the pool. Leonardo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet are in the pool trying to trying to, to hold on to that little bit of, 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 of boat or wherever they were holding on to. The Serie A executives die, come into the – go past them, take the life jacket off them and let them sink. That's what Serie A does when it comes to marketing. Mm-hmm. It's just – no, it's astonishingly stupid, and and it's just yeah, I don't know. It's, it's just it's classic Serie A. And this is vintage Serie A. Yeah, like <laughs> for me, this is oh, it's so dumb. Someone needs so to put together uh, someone that's good. Someone needs to put together a video compilation of all all of these things, like Serie A asses. Mm-hmm. I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's it's asininely stupid. It's an unforced error. There's no need for it. You can put a post on your own social media. You don't need to involve the club, and 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 it's just. You know, <laughs> silly ass. It's silly ass things. What are you going to do? <laughs> yeah, what are you going to do? Okay, right. Extra long show for you today. There was a lot to talk about. Um, we'll be back on Thursday. No, Tuesday for the Tuesday for Q&A, the Q&A and then Thursday for uh, the midweek show. Yeah, we will. Okay, great. Let's leave it at that. Um, have a good week, everybody. See you on Tuesday. Until then, ciao, ciao.